Welcome back to the show. Joining me this week is Adam Ortoff. He's an energy investor and the business development manager at Upstream Data. Adam, it's really good to see you. It's been a while. We haven't been at a conference together for a couple months. Yeah, I'm happy to do this. I think we've been talking about recording a Coin Stories podcast for probably a year now. And then, you know, our lives are so crazy that coordinating is is impossible. But here in 2024, January, we, we made it happen. So glad to be here. I know. Well, people might recognize you from, I did a hard money piece back uh, about a year and a half ago in Austin, where we talked a little bit about your work. And I, I know a lot of people follow you. I think they just call you Denver. So <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your background and sort of how you came to work in the Bitcoin space. Yeah, I mean, this is for me, my story is a little bit happen chance, right? Like I fell kind of backwards um, into oil and gas. I was working as a manager of a couple of retail stores here in Colorado, and a guy happened to come in that owned a software company in the oil and gas space, a production accounting software company. Not a very sexy topic when it when it comes to you know anything anything in the world you could be doing um, on, on a scale of coolness, oil and gas production accounting is pretty low. Um, but, you know, what he offered me to come in effectively be like the director of marketing and sales for this software company was a great offer. And, you know, I, I just chased that opportunity. Um, in the midst of that, I learned how to, do, how to formally do oil and gas production accounting, um, which taught me a lot about oil and gas, right? I was pretty ignorant to the oil and gas industry but I'm mathematically proficient. Um, you know, I'm in economics. I got a major in economics and, and business. And so I, I quickly understood the investment of upstream oil and gas production. You know, what, what kind of capital is required to drill a well? What kind, you know, hopefully what kind of production you, you expect to find, operational costs, those things. And that's when I discovered Bitcoin. Um, and I thought Bitcoin was a scam um, just from, you know, that was my assumption. And so I was eager to prove the scam by understanding how it was produced. I figured if I understood how it was produced, I'd, I'd figure out where somebody was gaming this system. And upon learning about how Bitcoin is produced, right, and how thermodynamic laws relate to computer science, I realized very quickly, this is an open and competitive energy market. And the oil and gas industry is going to participate in a big way in this market. And so I started just chasing that idea, right, just chasing a good idea. So for people who are unfamiliar with upstream data, can you kind of explain what is it? How'd you get involved? And what's the what's the sort of work that you do? Yeah. So um, to summarize, you know, if I were to put upstream data in a box, I would say that, you know, we're an oil and gas service company. We're not a Bitcoin company. Uh, we're certainly not a, a Bitcoin mining company. We're an oil and gas service company. We're a full fabrication shop and motor shop. So we build portable Bitcoin mines. Um, some with natural gas engines, some without natural gas engines, right? And a natural gas engine is much like an automotive engine. It's, it's you know, a machine that turns natural gas into electricity, into power. Um, we, that's our primary kind of bread and butter. That's our competitive edge. And what we started doing, uh, upstream data was started January 1st, 2017. But we also do a ton of work with oil and gas producers, building them on-site equipment and on-site enclosures that have nothing to do with Bitcoin. Right. I'd say maybe 35, 40 percent of our business has absolutely nothing to do with Bitcoin. You know, we sell engines and buildings for other purposes as well. But um, that's really our niche. And what we're building for, I mean, the future that Upstream Data is building for is the one that Steve Barber, our founder, you know, proved out and discovered early on, like I said, 2016, 2017, which is one of the most optimal ways to run an oil and gas production site is by using the natural gas, the which is effectively a byproduct that's produced to power the well site and any kilowatt hour of extra excess power that you generate, send it over to some computers and mine Bitcoin. That way, you know, you look at an engine as an asset, right? As something you invested in to run your operation. Well, as an asset, every single, you know, little piece of utility that that asset produces, you're monetizing, right? You're monetizing in the form of either it's running your well site and helping you produce oil or you're sending it over to some Bitcoin computers and you're effectively selling it um, by mining the Bitcoin network. And that way you just, it's a step function increase in your operational efficiency as an energy producer. And your return on capital for that, for that asset, for that investment is, you know, grossly improved. Um, and ultimately just as a, um, an entrepreneur, you're a better allocator of resources, right? So that's the future we're building for. Those are the products we're building for and optimizing for. And, you know, it's still early, right? We're what, goodness now, I guess seven years or so in, 
Um, time flies, but still the top of the first inning when it comes to how Bitcoin mining is disrupting upstream oil and gas. Well, I'm really excited to dig into some of these topics because I do think that Bitcoin mining is going to revolutionize the energy industry. And I think there are a lot of misconceptions out there. I've had the chance to see some of these upstream data. They look like a, like little storage containers. And all of a sudden you look inside and there are a bunch of ASICs. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so let's get into um, some of the, uh, the, the, I don't, the really important aspects of Bitcoin that maybe some people watching this and listening appreciate already and others sort of haven't been fully orange pilled. First of all, for you during that process where you were like, I'm going to figure out if there's something wrong with Bitcoin and I'm going to prove that it's a scam. When you realize that it's not, and you talked about thermodynamic, you know, uh, it's, it's thermodynamically strong and it's technically strong and all these things. What was it for you that helped you get to that point? What was that aha moment or realization that this thing can't be hacked? It's impervious to any sort of, um, you know, attack. It's actually the best possible network that has ever existed. Yeah. Um, the exact, the conclusion I came to that changed everything was, um, I, I think the way that I would put it is, you know, how thermodynamic law relates to computer science, right? And what I mean by that is, I mean, I, I had already understood and, and, you know, I'm convinced that nobody can, can get an unfair advantage when it comes to generating a kilowatt hour or a right. BTU, right? Think about like, or like a calorie of, of heat or of energy, right? You know, a unit of energy, much like a barrel of oil, right? Many people don't know this, but a barrel of oil is a lot like, it's, it's, it's kind of like one kilowatt hour of energy. A barrel of oil is a specific measurement, right? It has a specific amount of potential energy in it, a specific amount of BTUs. It's not just a certain amount of fluid. It's a certain amount of fluid at a certain energy density. And so I knew that you couldn't cheat a kilowatt hour. Upon learning how computer science, you know, the kind of the fundamentals of computer science, um, and, and I'll share them as best I can, right? I'm not an engineer, but ultimately at the end of the day, a computer is just electricity running through circuits. Right. That's all. That's all really a computer is. It's circuits, um, much like a Bitcoin miner call is called an ASIC, which is, you know, an application specific integrated circuit. And so there's no way to cheat or get an unfair advantage at running electrons through a circuit. When I understood that the conversion of electricity to computational work, right, in other words, how how much work can a computer do, do off of just one unit of, of um, electricity mm -hmm. upon understanding that that there were limits to that, right? Like it wasn't infinite. Um, even if you have the most, you know, incredibly efficient computer and it's doing quadrillions of, of functions, when you take the amount of functions it's, or the amount of power it's used and you divide the amount of functions, it's more than zero, right? It might be really close to zero, but it's, it's more than zero, it's non-zero. And so what that means is there's no way to generate computational work without electricity. And electricity I knew was something you couldn't unfairly produce. Mm -hmm. So if producing computational work is how you produce Bitcoin, nobody can unfairly produce this. No, I, I knew in that moment, nobody has an unfair advantage at producing Bitcoin. Um, I then, you know, ran to discover what is entering this, this market actually like, like you know, what kind of obstacles are actually pragmatically in place to enter this market. And I found this is absolutely the lowest barrier to entry of any industry that has ever existed. Right. I mean, when it comes to mining Bitcoin, an eight year old kid can follow pretty simple, maybe, you know, six step instructions on plugging in a computer, pointing it at a Bitcoin mining pool. And now I'm competing with a six year old kid, you know, in, in a in a serious disruptive industry. Um, what other you know, what other industry, what other process can a six year old or maybe call it a 12 year old kid compete and, and actually, you know, have a shot. Right. Gold mining. You know, no way. Like, those, you know. He can't even, he can't even drive the freaking bulldozer. <laughs> right. And so, you know, I thought about pros prospecting for gold when I lived in California. Hey, I don't believe people you. That still, you know, they go to these little <laughs> river areas and they like do the panning for gold. I was like, maybe I'll find this big bulldozer. Hey, I mean, you know, I think if Bitcoin didn't exist, I would, I would probably be but, in the yeah, gold that industry was years, one way that was or before another. I knew. That was before of I knew course. Bitcoin. Right. <laughs> um, but like, you know, th that was the, that was the start of, that was the spark, right? When I understood, I went, holy crap. Okay. Maybe this isn't a rigged game. Um, you know, okay. I wasn't convinced that Bitcoin wasn't like was the greatest thing ever, but 
But I was like, at the end of the day, this is an open and competitive energy market. And I was, mm -hmm. I was doing production um, accounting for a bunch of oil and gas companies in Wyoming, Colorado, Texas. And I knew like, I knew precisely where and precisely how much these oil and gas companies were wasting in the form of flaring gas. Like, and I knew the dollar value had they been able to sell to a pipeline. So I was mm -hmm. very eager to go run the numbers and figure out, Hey, how much gas do I need to generate enough electricity that I can mine enough Bitcoin that it's worth something. So I, when I went and figured out those numbers, which was a funny process, by the way, I mean, I was calling these generator companies and, and asking them like, so what's the consumption rate, you know? And like, they would, and they would be like, well, at what, at full load or at half load or at 80% load? And I'm like, crap, I don't know what that means. So then I have to go learn, you know, what, what does 80% load, right? What does that yeah. mean? And then I'd call back. And when I finally got those numbers down, I went, holy crap, like this isn't a get rich quick scheme, but this is an incredibly attractive option for oil and gas producers to sell their natural gas, right? Like this is viable, period. Coin Stories is brought to you by BitDeer, where the power of Bitcoin mining is at your fingertips. As a publicly traded leader, BitDeer's global reach and scale means they're everywhere you need them to be, ensuring you're part of the thriving Bitcoin economy. BitDeer's not just mining, they are industry pioneers, and BitDeer stands alone as the only vertically integrated, technology-focused Bitcoin mining company. What does that mean? Well, they're not just deploying, but developing the latest tech to make Bitcoin mining more efficient and effective. With the industry's most experienced leadership team, innovation is in their DNA. And it shows with a quarter of their workforce dedicated to research and development, pushing the boundaries of what's possible in Bitcoin mining. And now they're leveraging years of expertise in data center and cloud management into high-performance computing through a recently announced partnership with NVIDIA. Join BitDeer in reshaping the world of Bitcoin mining. Learn more at bitdeer.com and explore how they are pioneering the future today. Okay, so I want to get to um, the stranded, the flared gas component. But first, I think it actually would be really important for you to help people understand the difference between energy and electricity, because those two words get conflated a lot. And one thing that I love about um, your tweets over the years is you focus on this very important message of how energy is life. There's there's this whole narrative right now that, oh, we need to somehow, you know, cut energy use. It's like, okay, so you want to cut human flourishing and ability to pr produce and prosper and flourish. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? Because you obviously know the space really well, and it can get very confusing for some people. Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that. I'm glad you asked me to specify, you know, to differentiate between energy and power. Um, it's very important. It may seem nuanced, but it's very important. Um, and you're right. They often get conflated or, or the user, the words are used interchangeably when they shouldn't be. And so mm -hmm. to me, right, I look at, I look at energy as, you know, as this massive encompassing, uh, category or, or word, right. Power specifically is electricity. Um, it's, you know, in, societal infrastructure, core infrastructure to society, um, electricity at the industrial level of manufacturing, but as well as at the residential level of, you know, my toaster. Um, electricity is only a small part of energy, of energy consumption and production. It's what a lot of people focus on. And it's certainly a lot of what this like green net zero movement is on is let's generate carbon free electricity. Some people will say carbon free energy, which is certainly laughable, but energy is even more than, you know, just um, electricity. Energy is putting fuel in my car, um, propane for my barbecue, right? Like the, the petroleum products themselves, like plastics and, and adhesives and lubricants and, you know, um, right. there are different... a lot of petrochemicals oh, like in my chair, I mean, right? Everything. <laughs> of course. No, like of a, of a barrel of oil and, you know, people can correct me if I'm wrong or correct me here, but I think it's something like only, you know, 45 or 50% of a barrel of oil goes to gasoline, like goes to, um, either gasoline or diesel combustible fuel mm -hmm. for cars. The rest go to like plastics. And I mean, even a wind turbine itself is the, the, the physical structure of a wind turbine is what's called epoxy resin. That's a petroleum product. Mm -hmm. Um, right. Like it's, it's derived from petroleum. So when people, if you take a, a, a holistic look at energy consumption and production, you know, and just even consider things like like the bag of dog food, maybe that you picked up at the grocery store for the, the little puppy you've got. Um, 
you know, how did that bag of dog food get to that shelf at that price? And, and honestly, what is that bag made of? Like literally the bag itself might be a petroleum product um, right. or it was right. It was produced in a facility that was the electricity was derived from natural gas or coal. Um, mm -hmm. So like looking, looking at from a holistic point of view, even if the electricity is, you know, in the manufacturing process was solar and, and such. At the end of the day, global transportation, like global shipping and commerce, the movement of goods across the globe is a 99.999%, you know, hydrocarbon or fossil fuel intensive process, mainly crossing oceans. Um, nobody crosses oceans without a ton of petroleum because nobody's insane enough to get on a super barge with only a sail. Um, so global, like the globalization, global marketplace the foundation of it, the foundation of every industry is oil and gas, is petroleum. And I think that people are, are missing that in this, this idea of an energy transition because mm -hmm. there is no substitute um, for, for petroleum um, in certain aspects. And mm -hmm. there's certainly no substitute for certain petroleum products. Um, so, and, and in fact, I would argue the, the beautiful thing about oil and gas is that it, it was a substitute for a lot of uh, consumption that was unnecessary that that humans were uh, mm -hmm. partaking in things like deforesting right like coal stopped allowed us to stop cutting down forests like we don't need to burn wood anymore we have coal it's way better right, right? so you right. can either burn living high you can either burn living carbons or you can burn dead carbons like mm -hmm. you can consume living carbon or, or dead carbon i think dead carbon is superior and typically it's much more thermodynamically efficient like coal um you know even nuclear right nuclear is a great electricity power source, very efficient, but the foundation of, of a nuclear industry is a robust and thriving oil and gas industry because you have to mine the uranium, you have to refine it, you have to transport it, you have to have steel and concrete, and you have to have um, really, really intricate and elaborate infrastructure for a nuclear power plant, mm -hmm. which all relies on oil and gas. So oil and gas is the, is the foundation. The fact that Bitcoin disrupts it was everything to me, right? That's when I, I saw, wow, the, the potential here is is immeasurable. Well, and isn't it ironic that somehow there are so many people passionate about the green movement who are totally fine with mining lithium and all these like rare metals in different parts of the world in order to build your electric car and all of that, not realizing what is behind it in the supply chain. Um, Let's talk about how it's revolutionizing, though, this industry, because one thing that I learned when I uh, started digging into Bitcoin that I was fascinated by is how much energy is stranded or wasted around the world, creating this massive opportunity for location agnostic miners to go and actually build out and create opportunities to create infrastructure and power local communities and all of that. So can you talk about that aspect and ultimately how it's being um, utilized here in the U S with some of these massive companies? Oh yeah. I mean, this is, this is bigger than, than even you're thinking it's bigger than even I'm thinking about the amount of waste energy in the world is good. Goodness. Seemingly immeasurable. Like I can tell you just in the United States, when it comes to natural gas, What's reported in the oil field is about a billion cubic feet of natural gas per day. What, what is that to someone? Can, What's a billion cubic feet? Cubic feet? Um, if you can imagine a box that is like a mile by a mile by a mile, like a cubic mile of air, right? Um, like billion cubic feet of a million MCF. In terms of power, that's three and a half, four gigawatts of continuous power, which would be an, is enough power for about um, a million homes. Wow. Yeah, a million single family homes, right? So maybe 5 million people. And why power. is it wasted? And why is it wasted? It's because oil and gas producers just hate the planet and they just want to destroy everything. <laughs> um, no, I mean, why is it wasted? It's a sheer um, result of economics and and the difficulty of transporting energy, right? Producing energy, again, not, not power, not electricity, but energy like natural gas or oil, that's only step one, right? That's an important step, a vital step. A lot of people focus on that and a lot of loss and waste and, and efficiencies can be gained in that step. But the step of getting the energy, what we call downstream to a market 
at a profit is a whole nother step. And now oils, the great thing about oil is that it's so incredibly energy dense and valuable that you can literally fill a truck with oil and the cost to move that truck is, you know, is, is no big deal for, it just gets built into the price of the oil with natural gas. Not this, not the case there, you know, supply of natural gas is so immense. I mean, heck we're wasting a billion cubic feet of de- a day um, that the price per unit is so low that, you know, because it's a gas, the amount you could put in a truck, you know, the cost to bring it to market, you'd be spending $5 to make two. So yeah. what we need to move gas is a pipeline. Um, pipelines take significant amounts of capital, time. There's a lot of regulatory loopholes to jump through, headaches, paperwork, so on and so forth. At the end of the day, it's costly um, and it's, it's not a great route, but it's the only option that you have if you wanted to sell gas until Bitcoin. The reason that this gas is stranded is, for example, there may be some wells. Uh, I've got a customer right now who has a well out in, um, in uh, Kentucky. The well, they could build a pipeline. The cost to build a pipeline would be about like $3.5 million. The amount of gas that the well produces is such that they would then be making like $150 a day. Right? Nobody's wow. going to spend $4 million to make $150 a day. Right? No, or at least nobody that's sane is going to. So what should they do? Should they just shut the well in? Well, but it's also, the well is also making like maybe 150 grand a year in oil. So you're not going to not produce that oil. I mean, there's a massive global demand for oil that we're not even meeting. And so what do they do? They burn it, right? It's, hey, we want the oil. We're going to produce this well. You know, it's, we're going to make 150 grand a year selling the oil on this well. What are we going to do with this gas? Just light it on fire. And that's and so it's, a, it's essentially that that gas is a byproduct and, and, yeah, it, I, and, and then you get, it flares. Yeah. The way to think about it is nobody goes and drills for drills for oil and gas. Nobody drills for gas. Everybody that drills is looking for oil. Right. You know, best case scenario, you find a ton of oil with almost no gas. Worst case scenario, you find nothing like like maybe water. Um, but the second worst case scenario is you don't find any oil, but you find a bunch of gas or maybe just a tiny bit of oil and a lot of gas. Um, that is the, the inherent context of this problem and why it exists. So it's not that people are wasteful. Um, it's kind of like a waterfall in the middle of nowhere. It's like, well, heck we could, we could build a little hydroelectric dam and have a ton of power right here, but who would buy it? Right. And that's the, that's the groundbreaking earth shattering innovation that is Bitcoin mining is for the first time in history, truly in history, you can sell power. And you have no counterparty risk. Nobody's actually even buying the power, right? The Bitcoin network was programmed 15 years ago to reward me for my power today. So I have no counterparty risk, which counterparty risk in energy is huge, right? Sometimes you have a thriving, you know, power plant maybe, and then an industry dries up like a steel, you know, manufacturing industry and and everybody in the town leaves. And now you've got a five megawatt or 10 megawatt power plant and nobody to buy it. You're sunk. Well, with Bitcoin mining, Anytime that there's, you know, electricity that has nobody to buy it, the Bitcoin network is like, hey, like I was pre-programmed to reward you. How much you're going to get, you know, you don't get to negotiate it. The, yeah. the network sets the price, but it's, it's greater than zero. And so that innovation, ultimately, we can sell electricity over the Internet to an autonomous consumer. And that is what starts to, to rip apart kind of the foundation of, of energy production as we understand it. Um, and it's going to, you know, we're going to have to rewrite some laws. We're going to have to, the world's going to have to change because of this innovation. Mm-hmm. So obviously people are probably familiar with some of the big oil and gas companies that are here in the U.S., these massive corporations. Sometimes you see headlines now where they're moving into this space, or maybe there's like a subsidiary that's moving in and starting to do Bitcoin mining. I've also heard that some of them are doing this specifically to offset their carbon footprint. So can you talk about what's happening and are we going to see more of these like the Shells, the Chevrons, all of these big, you know, wherever you fill up your gas tank, are they all going to be mining Bitcoin? Yes, they all will be mining Bitcoin. Um, at what scale, in what time frame, um, you know, that's, that's subject to, to change a little bit. At the end of the day, Bitcoin needs to become more valuable. Um, if you, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, a billion cubic feet a day of natural gas just in the United States is wasted. Well, the numbers on that, right, I said are about four gigawatts of power, which would be equivalent to, uh, my goodness, I mean, one gigawatt is like 
40 exahash. So it, this this is equivalent to like half or a third of the t- of all the Bitcoin mining going on right now. You know, a third of it or half of it could take place on wasted gas just in North America. Um, that's a lot, Incredible. right? Yeah. It's it's huge. It's 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 really hard to even quantify and think about. But what I can think about and what I can calculate and what I have calculated is, let's say that 100% of that gas tomorrow was all of a sudden used to mine Bitcoin. What would, the, what would things look like? What would the numbers look like? Well, what you would find is we'd, there'd, be, there'd be too much competition, right? In other words, there'd be so many people mining Bitcoin, nobody would be earning very much money, right? Um, and so in order for that next entrant to come in, in order for that next Bitcoin mine to get deployed to the oil field, I mean, I've run the numbers with the hat. We've got halvings coming up, right? So even less Bitcoin, meaning the price needs to be higher. I mean, this is, in my mind, what justifies a $750,000, $1.5 million Bitcoin price within the next, you know, eight, 10 years. Um, Because there's truly that much stranded energy demand. There's that much energy to go out and rescue. And so it's immense, right? And in my mind, it's it's where the value is. But if you look at it today, it's about 1,000 Bitcoin are released to miners per day. So it's about $40 million a day, $40 million a day. That's kind of a, that's a joke to oil and gas producers, right? If you look at global, global oil trade, 40 million bucks a day. So even if, you know, some of these companies had 100% of the mining, it wouldn't even be that big of a part of their company, right? Wow. Um, So these guys produce serious value, right? I mean, they're producing, I mean, a million, a million barrels of oil is 75 million bucks, right? That's, that's double all Bitcoin rewards in a day. So ultimately, we're just not at the scale yet. It's it's still that early, right? You might think forty thousand dollar Bitcoin, I missed the boat, it's over. I'm sitting here going, you know, I'm old, I'm thirty two years old. I'm I'm expecting the disruption in in how Bitcoin mining starts really changing these industries when I'm like you know forty forty five years old, right? Like that's when things are going to start to take big steps forward um, because right now it, it doesn't make sense to invest a billion dollars in mining Bitcoin when the total network rewards are 40 million bucks a day. Like Mm -hmm. that's a, that's a hard sell unless all you do as a company is mine Bitcoin. But if you're an oil and gas company, what they're figuring out right now and what we do at upstream data, like what I, what I do with oil and gas producers is find out where does Bitcoin mining fit in your production portfolio? Where is it appropriate? Where is it not appropriate? At what cost is it appropriate? Um, For what Mm -hmm. time horizon? Those are the things that we're figuring out today. Um, like the oil, most oil and gas producers certainly haven't come to any conclusion of like Bitcoin doesn't fit in the oil field, right? Like, I mean, and if they have, I'd love to talk to them because I could, I could prove to them with objective data that it, it may not exist everywhere and it may not be appropriate everywhere, but there's a lot of places where it makes a ton of sense. It's time for another quick break to hear these messages from my partners. Next up, Bitcoin 2024, the world's largest Bitcoin conference, is coming to Nashville this year. Come join us for three amazing days of keynotes, panels, networking events, and my Women of Bitcoin brunch. The Bitcoin conference is where I launched my podcast almost three years ago. You never know what can happen or who you can meet here. Head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, for 10% off. Next up, CoinKite, which makes everything you need to safely self-custody your Bitcoin, including the cold card wallet. This is the cold storage device I use for safekeeping my Bitcoin. You can verify the source code, it's ultra secure, and it's easy to use even if you're a beginner. Head to their site in my show notes and get a 5% discount with promo code COINSTORIES. Next up, crowd health. Health insurance costs are sky high, and it's money that feels wasted if you don't need a doctor. By crowdfunding healthcare with other Bitcoiners, I get to avoid traditional insurance fees and support real people instead of mega corporations. Crowd health also works to reduce your medical bills, so the community's contributions cover more. Imagine spending just $100 a month on healthcare and investing the rest in Bitcoin. If you're interested, visit joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie. All right, back to the show. Can you talk to me a little bit about uh, the renewable energy space and how uh, before Bitcoin mining, a lot of these facilities, they were so dependent on subsidies because they just they couldn't break even right that at times the energy is negatively priced, there's supply and demand that's not balanced. But then all of a sudden you have this buyer that's consistently needing energy night and day, right? It can come in, it can shut off like a light switch. Can you talk about how that is actually helping 
I, I don't necessarily believe that we're going to have this transition that a lot of people are pushing for, but obviously a lot of people are pushing toward more and more infrastructure focused on solar and wind and all of that. And Bitcoin of actually is even helping that. Oh, well, that's the beautiful, beautiful thing about Bitcoin is Bitcoin doesn't discriminate. It is, the, you know, it, it is truly a, an apolitical and agnostic commodity. And I'm glad you brought this up. And let's let's rustle some feathers a little bit, right? Let's let's talk a little bit about some numbers and let's let's go against the grain of the mainstream. The reason that Bitcoin and you're and you're absolutely right, Bitcoin uplifts all energy production and power generation, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't uplift all energy production and power generation equally, um, and that's because some energy, some power generation, energy production is a lot more inefficient. There's a lot more waste. Bitcoin thrives on waste. It, it seeks out waste. It's like an insidious, you know, vacuum that 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 creeps through markets and and finds waste, um, and and ultimately creates massive opportunity wherever there there's waste. Wind and solar are incredibly wasteful, right? They're very inefficient. They're called intermittent or unreliable is probably a better term than renewable. Um, and just so happens that. With both wind and solar, like with solar, the sun's usually shining when people aren't consuming electricity <laughs> and it's not shining when they are. Um, and with wind, oftentimes the wind's blowing when they're not consuming electricity and, and when they need it, it's not blowing. And so there's these massive or these, there's these frequent moments of tons of production, no consumption, you know, tons of, tons of demand, no supply. And so that waste Bitcoin mining has has started to thrive, right? People rightfully noticed, hey, anytime that we're producing a ton of power with solar and nobody's consuming it, let's push it over to Bitcoin mines. And then when people start demanding it, turn off, you know, turn off the, the computers, push the electricity over here because, you know, they're willing to pay 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Right. You know, if they're not willing to pay that, then we'll send it, you know, then we'll mine Bitcoin with it. Otherwise, we're going to sell it to them. And so that function we're just still in the early days of, of that reality disrupting um, upstream power generation. And, and in the form of wind and solar, it's, it's going in a big way. Same thing with oil and gas, right? There's tons of waste in the oil field. Yeah. Bitcoin is, is going right after it. But what gets really fun is, is the numbers, right? Like, like you said about, about this being profitable or not. And, you know, I get, I get calls all the time. I, I can't tell you how, many, how much time I've spent looking at the specific precise numbers of uh, solar deployments and solar Bitcoin mining. I'll just give you a quick example, no more than 30 seconds. So if you wanted to have a five megawatt setup and you were going to use solar, that would cost you about $5 million, $6 million in solar panels for five megawatts. But if you want to run all the time, you need 10 megawatts of solar panels because you need to produce double what you consume. And, ha and you need to send half of it to batteries so that at nighttime, your miners will pull from the battery. And then during the day, you know, you'll power your computers and charge the batteries. So you need 10 megawatts of, of solar to run a five megawatt operation. So you need 10 million bucks of panels. But then in terms of batteries, what do you need? Well, you're running five megawatts for 24 hours. You need 120 megawatt hours of battery, which may be 40, 50 grand. So for a five megawatt operation, you're talking about like a 55, 60 million dollar investment in the oil field with natural gas, five megawatt operation two two and a half million bucks. You're off and running right now. The difference is right. The solar's free. Almost not. It's not, nothing's ever free, right? You, there's cost to operate. You got to clean the panels, right? And so on and so forth. But your marginal cost on solar is almost zero with natural gas. Even it, it's a waste, but you have to maintain the engine. So there's some costs there and I've run the numbers. How long would you have to run the solar operation before, you know, in order so that the investment over here finally beat out this investment, right? Became more attractive. And it's like 44 years. Wow. I mean, wow. Well, those are the numbers I'm running. Now you throw in subsidies and solar maybe becomes a little bit more attractive, but I still look at the numbers and I go, I mean, this is why I, I, I'm shouting mm -hmm. at the world and, and yeah. why I'm, I'm often challenging people is because I run these numbers. I'm a slave to the numbers and man, natural gas and, and coal when, uh, from an investment standpoint, a little bit of money, you know, for 2 million bucks, you can power like literally what 1500 homes with, with a natural gas engine. 
and you need 40 million bucks, 50 million bucks to do the same thing with solar. Um, mm-hmm. You know, as an allocator of resources, right? Where you know, as a society, if we spend our efforts and our capital and our resources yeah. doing solar instead of this, you know, in 10 years, what kind of difference, what kind of a different world are we going to see? Right. Meanwhile, right. China's building two new coal plants per week. I know. Um, and we're starving and, ourselves slowly. And we're, yeah, we're shutting down. We're shutting down our coal, hopefully to replace it with some natural gas and nuclear later. China's got plans for, I think, 644 industrial coal plants over the next like two and a half, three years, over the next, you know, right. 36, 48 months. I don't know how we're going to compete. So right. I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to fight the good fight and swing the pendulum back, you know, have people celebrate all yeah. energy, all power. Right. Well, and energy, it is that, that first and most important input into the whole production process that you have yes. to account for. Um, it is fascinating. You're bringing up a lot of points that I recall reading in Fossil Future by Alex Epstein, who I think does Absolutely. a really good job focusing on, you know, the fact that we're, we're putting aside human prosperity and flourishing um, for some, some of these narratives are outright false, but ultimately the, the one that we should be most concerned with is go- government ultimately reaching in, intervening in what should be a free market, picking winners and losers and subsidizing what, what would be failed businesses that just wouldn't cut it in the free market. And that impacts all of us and we're all paying for it. Um, and you're right. I mean, you look at other countries and they're obviously going in a different direction and there's a reason why certain energy sources are the most efficient and cost effective. And yeah. I mean, I, I tell people this with coal sometimes. I, I, I try to get people to think about coal because because of marketing and because of this green movement, when you say coal to somebody, I think all they think about is like somebody like cough, like the black lung and like black smoke and yes. pollution. It's just all negative, right? And I, I, I want them to think about it a little bit differently. And I tell them like, listen, when it comes to energy storage, you can think about a battery, like a lithium ion battery, right? You think about the Tesla Powerwall, the one that's like 20 kilowatt hours that you could have at your house. I think it's like 20 grand or something like 20,000 mm-hmm. bucks. Well, what does a $20,000 pile of coal look like? Like literally just a pile because that is a battery. That's nature's battery, right? The sun from thousands of years ago, ultimately transferred energy to plant life, which then mm-hmm. was buried and created carbon, right? Coal. And so this is, Coal is a, is a battery of, you know, is nature's battery. And it, and from a storage standpoint, it's the most beautiful thing. Literally you have a mountain of it and anytime you need electricity, you just shovel it into the furnace, right? Mm-hmm. Like you don't even need to cover it with a tarp. Like it can get rained on and snowed on. And yeah. like, you know, pa- like, like in Texas, when they had that great freeze, if they had a, if they had coal plants standing by, you just shovel in some coal into the oven. Everybody gets electrified life. Literally nobody even, you know, life doesn't change, even though it's negative 10 outside and, and crazy weather. Um, that's, that's how we uplift humanity, solar, you know, and wind goodness, like that reliability factor is huge, right? What, what, you know, what, what actually happens when humans lose access to power? Um, like people die, right? Like truly like, like deaths happen. Um, I mean, electricity is, is you said it's that fundamental input from a Mm -hmm. business or an industrial standpoint, I'd say it's the fundamental input from, you know, the human experience Mm -hmm. um from the human condition where i would argue electricity is far more important than clean water or healthcare or any of that's any of those things because electricity you know abundant affordable and reliable electricity provides all of those things right with electricity you can have healthcare you can have clean water right it powers the technologies that will allow you to clean the water and to you know irrigate and all of that so okay i totally i totally get what you're saying let me play devil's advocate for yeah. a second the people that you know they do have these images conjured in their minds of you know the the dark coal smoke <laughs> and um and icebergs melting. And I mean, I lived in Los Angeles for a very long time. They're definitely, you, you drive into LA from like Orange County and you just see that. Oh yeah. Flying in over and all. Flying in, you can see the, like, I I remember seeing that first time I flew into LA or I flew into maybe it was Ontario, but either way. Yeah. yeah, Same thing. Like there's there's that hanging cloud of pollution and it's so, so much worse than other countries. Okay. So you're, you're someone who feels very passionately that like, I want clean air. I want a clean environment. I want clean oceans. 
emissions. I'm concerned that fossil fuels are contributing to this. I want a future where we take the power of the sun, which if we, I think Jeff Booth wrote this in his book that like the the amount that shines in one day can like power us for a lifetime or something, but we can't, the technology today with batteries, we can't properly harness all of that energy, right? Maybe in several decades or a century we will. But what do you say to those people who are like, I'm concerned about this. I'm for a transition. Maybe it shouldn't happen as quickly as possible, but we should be powered by these renewable energy sources that don't give off carbon, that don't contribute to some of these problems. How do we get there? And can Bitcoin help with that? Yeah. Um, to that person, I mean, I, I, it would be a tough conversation in the sense that I, I would have to enlighten them to the reality um, that combustion is going to take place. It's just a matter of where and when. So solar's great, right? Like you can, the idea of capturing the sun's, you know, it's, it's this giant nuclear reactor in the sky, right? Like it does, it costs zero to maintain it. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, the problem is this, how do you produce a solar panel, right? You have to mine minerals. You have to move, you have to move earth. You have to, you have to dig in the dirt. Um, you have to, you know, get things like manganese and nickel and lithium, um, and aluminum. Mm -hmm. How do you move earth, right? You can't, I mean, we, we have no way of moving earth. We have, we have no solar powered bulldozer or wind powered bulldozer. And in fact, we have no way of producing high grade steel without coal or petroleum. So what the bulldozer is made of is a petroleum product. Um, the rubber tires, right? The loop, even if it's, even if it's an electric bulldozer somehow, which, you know, how did you get the, how did you ultimately get the minerals and manufacture the battery? Um, how'd you transport it again? How did you cross the ocean? Did you have a battery powered super barge ship? Is your, you know, um, th these are the questions I want to have, right? Concrete, like industrial grade quality concrete that we use to build our bridges and things and steel absolutely can't right now. We have no means of doing it, at least at any reasonable cost. Um, but when it comes to high grade steel, we have no way of, of doing it without coal. So it's like, do we want to go back to cities being built out of wood? Because then we have to deforest, we have to cut down trees to use wood for, and then our cities will burn down. Um, I personally don't want to drive across wooden bridges. Like I, I prefer steel, right? So we have to ask ourselves, what kind of quality of life do we want? Do you want to be in a, do you want to have open heart surgery in a hospital that's powered only by solar? Um, you know, on a cloudy day, does, does, you, does your life saving, you know, uh, equipment go out? Um, how do you even have an open heart transplant? Well, you have to get an organ from you know New Jersey to LA in X amount of time at X amount of cost to put it in somebody else's chest and save their life. That is an incredibly energy intensive uh, service, right? Open heart transplant is um, like, it's a miracle of oil and gas and petroleum, right? I mean, you might not think about open heart surgery as a result of oil and gas. I guarantee, I, I promise you it is. So yes, while this idea of capturing the sun's energy and you know, life running autonomously on that energy, at that energy and power. Well, that's a beautiful dream. You know, so is unicorns running on rainbows, pooping glitter. You know, it's just, it's just not reality. It's not reality based. I think, yes, we should always strive to increase our efficiency. You know, I would argue that wind, wind power is 15th century technology, right? That's nothing new. Um, solar power, even like humans used to, I mean, humans figured out early on that we could use, there were these certain rocks, which ended up having like high nickel and, um, thermo, you know, thermo properties that they'd set them out in the sun and they'd store a ton of the sun's heat. And then they'd roll this rock into like their hut at night and it would just radiate heat. That's effectively the same. That's a battery, right? You just took the sun's energy, stored it in rocks. And then later on, you discharge that energy effectively just by letting it dissipate and you, you enjoyed that heat energy. We're doing the same, like a lithium ion battery. We dig rocks out of the ground. We just refine them. Right. And then we, we charge them with electrons, same effect, effectively the same principle. We've just increased that last, you know, 20% of efficiency. We've really pressed in and tried to get the most out of it. And what we find is battery technology sucks. 
I'm sorry, it sucks. Like, let me say it again, it sucks. You compare battery technology to just mining Bitcoin. Oh my gosh, industrial battery companies got to be shaking in their boots. They, they, they're the ones, honestly, they, they ought to be out there saying that Bitcoin's bad for the environment. We must ban it because that's their only hope for their batter, their industrial battery business to survive. Because every rational market participant sees the option of, hey, we could spend a hundred million dollars to have enough batteries so that we could, you know, use that to help supply the grid. Or we could just overproduce our power generation and have five million, ten million dollars of Bitcoin mining. And throw anytime we have excess, we throw the electricity over to the Bitcoin miners. And the economic benefit there will be greater even than than the operational benefit of batteries. I mean batteries are not great. Solar and batteries are awesome at the point of consumption. So at the individual scale, like I'm, I am one of the biggest solar maximals. I, I personally will have a fifty, seventy-five thousand dollar solar installment on my own property. It makes sense at the individual level for robustness, like to be a sovereign individual, to not be reliant on, you know, to have a backup uh, method of producing power and electrifying my life. I'll also have natural gas, a backup natural gas generator, and probably a diesel you know, multi-fuel generator as well. But at the industrial scale, like to, hey, let's tear down this coal plant and, and put out a couple, you know, square miles of solar. It, the numbers are terrible. The operational reliability and, and um, overall yeah. rating is terrible. I'm not an advocate for it, right? So th- these are the things I'm trying, these are the conversations I'm trying to have. I, I want to have these debates yeah. and say, hey, like, let's, let's get serious. Let's look at the real numbers, right. get rid of your subsidies. You know, as humans, where should we be investing our, our efforts? How do we want to build, you know, what future do we want to build? Right. Well, this is a really fascinating and I, I think important answer. I, I, a lot of people don't realize these nuances and the information when they're trying to I, push for certain agendas. Uh, I, I certainly don't think that the activists that are throwing, you know, food on masterpieces are aware of some of these. And I wish that people took the time to really understand because you're right there. There is so much behind the energy industry that I think people do not understand at all. And I hope that right now in our system with fiat, there's so much misallocation of capital. We have all these subsidies and we have so much intervention that we really don't know what technologies could be brought to the market that maybe would speed up some of these processes and build the right kind of battery that's going to harness, you know, enough energy for us to to sustain ourselves for a longer period of time. But like we're not there and we certainly won't be there if we continue in a in a world where capital is always mispriced and we continue to encourage monopolies and basically we remove the power financially from every individual. So, I appreciate everything that you said. That was a great long tangent. I loved it. Um, Okay. Before we start to wrap up, I did want to ask you something about, you know, you, you deal with a lot of landowners and I know that ownership around mineral, mineral, mineral rights is very complicated. And so how, what do people need to know and how will Bitcoin mining impact that? Yeah. I mean, how Bitcoin mining will impact like mineral right ownership and, and laws and things. It kind kind of remains to be seen. Um, we don't know yet, but what I can tell you is, is this, right? Like legacy thinking in, in the oil and gas world, the United States is unique. The United States is, I think the only country where individuals can own not just land, but all the minerals to the core of the earth, but below your land. The U S um, is the only place where those I believe are so. Places. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think exactly. I don't think anywhere else in the world do, do governments allow you to own the mineral rights. Like I think, like it, things function differently, even in Canada um, and mm-hmm. things when it, around mineral rights. Now you have like, right. the, if, if you produce on your land, so oftentimes, right, there's, there's maybe like a family that owns some yeah. land. Now they're not, produ- they're not oil and gas producers, right? They don't drill wells and things, but because their land has plenty of oil, what they do is they have an, uh, an oil and gas operation or production company come in and what they, their cut or their piece it typically is what's called a, like a one eighth royalty meaning okay. 12.5%. So 12.5% of all the oil you sell and you produce, you got you to gotta write us a check, right? You make a hundred bucks, you send us 12.50. The same goes for natural gas oftentimes. And sometimes this even occurs if a pipeline just crosses your, your land, 
right? So say they just, you know, they're just using your land as a through pass. Maybe you get a percentage of, of the natural gas wow. sales, right? So all this is, is interesting, but one of the, the area where, where Bitcoin mining um, has a, a great impact and I think is really interesting is around what's, what's considered due diligence or best effort, right? Like these contracts with the, with the production company, the person that owns the land, right? In the contract, they might have some language around like, hey, you're going to take, you're going to use your best effort to get me the best price for the oil and gas that you find on my land, right? You, you need to be a good steward of my minerals. So you, you're going to, you know, do your mm. best to maximize the amount of money you're going to make so that I met you maximize the amount of money I make. Now, obviously oh. they're already kind of incentivized to maximize their the money because maximize their own money for them. Right. So like natural market functions are such that they're already incentivized to, to, to do good by, by the landowner. But when it comes to natural gas, what if they're flaring right today? They're flaring and legacy thinking would say, well, yeah, they're producing oil. The cost for a pipeline is, isn't reasonable. It's unattractive. So we might as well just flare the gas. And if I was the landowner and you were, and you were flaring my gas, I'd say, what the hell? Why haven't you invested money? And why aren't you mining Bitcoin? I could be getting 12.5% of your Bitcoin mining earnings or even just 12.5% of what the natural gas would, you know, would be worth. Effectively, you could, you know, sell the gas to yourself at yeah. market cost. Right. So, but either way, I'm earning zero when I should be earning 12.5% of some Bitcoin mining earnings or some, some used gas. You're not, you know, you're not giving it your best effort. This is, this is not your, you so doing. Has this turned into some legal cases already? I, it's, it's still early, but I think, okay. I think yes. And, and here's an even more interesting fact, right? So along the lines of what I just said. So what if I was the um, oil and gas producer and say, I understand Bitcoin mining. Well, I'm going to go produce Bitcoin with this gas. Say I'm making $10 in MCF. Well, maybe I'm only paying the landowner 12.5% of, of, the, of the pipeline market value of that gas, which Bitcoin. is maybe not the Bitcoin earnings, which is maybe $3, like literally one third. So it's a difference. So it's like, hey, I'm paying you 12.5% of $3 in MCF, wow. but I'm actually making 10. So the landowners are going to, the landowners are going to come sue. They're going to say, hey, you, we're actually making ten dollars in MCF. You were only paying me three, and and wow. the producers are the producers are going to go. Hey, I I took risk and did my best effort to sell your gas, and I did. I sold your gas to to company, you know, to X Y Z company for three dollars in MCF. X, I happened to own X Y Z company, and then they took the gas and they were able to turn it into ten dollars in MCF by mining Bitcoin. Wow! But but they That's only cool. bought it at three, so you only are owed twelve point five percent on three dollars, right? So. Mm -hmm. All that isn't figured out yet. This this is new. This is new territory. So we're gonna like they're gonna have to bring the courts in. Language is gonna have to be rewritten. At the end of the day, because of Bitcoin, there is no such thing as stranded energy. Stranded energy doesn't exist anymore. Wow. Right. Because so you couldn't we have to change. monetize because you couldn't monetize it before. Bitcoin. So long as you can get if you can get okay. an internet connection, you can sell energy, right? So you, you just wow. you go from energy to power, from power to computational work, computational work to Bitcoin. And so fascinating. That is you know, fascinating. That, I think a lot of people are going to be interested in that, especially if they have any vested interests. Um, Adam, this has been super amazing. Before we um, before we close up, can you just offer any final thoughts? If there's something that I didn't ask you about that you really wanted to share or hit the point and drive it home, any any final thoughts? Yeah, I've got I've got one final thought I do want to share. Um, if you don't mind, you know, I think we're in a really exciting time in the Bitcoin mining world. It's still, like I said, it's still very, very early, but it's in a way it's a little bit more exciting than the early days because we're now, the hardware is now commoditizing. And what I mean by that is everyone's effectively mining with the same tools. Um, the efficiency is not getting any, not much better, very marginal. Really, this is a game of let's find the cheapest energy on the margin. And we're, what we're doing at Upstream Data is we're trying to optimize for that process. And the future that I'm seeing and what we're, what we're building for, what I'm proving out is I think these big Bitcoin mining companies, these big public miners, I've got a model with our portable, what we call load centers, our portable Bitcoin mines, that I think the capital efficiency from an investment standpoint is really attractive. But the really exciting thing is the ease of moving these Bitcoin mines around, moving this infrastructure physically from one location to the other is going to allow these really big Bitcoin miners 
the flexibility and and um, the optionality to arbitrage power prices on the continent of North America more or less in real time on a on a really small on a really short basis. And what I mean by that is, you know, a, a big Bitcoin miner like Marathon or Riot, one of these um, companies, they could have 500 megawatts, which is literally like 500 buildings, 20 foot little buildings um, in Kansas City. And maybe the Kansas City power provider, the, the person that they did business with, tries to raise the prices on them. But they know that over in, you know, Idaho and Boise, power's 25% cheaper. Well, they can run the numbers and they can go, hey, Kansas City, if you don't lower your prices, I'm going to pick up my 150 megawatts and I'm going to move it over here within 48, 72 hours. I'm going to be up and running consuming. And what, is, what does that mean? That's literally effectively like a consumer that's, you know, the, the price of power in Baltimore will impact the price of power in Boise wow. on like, a, you know, maybe on Monday, it doesn't seem like they're, they're interacted, but even just on a week or 10 day basis, they mm. could start impacting each other because of Bitcoin. Right. So literally it could be like, you know, in 25, 30 years, the news might be, yeah, there was a new plant opened up in Boise. And so, you know, power prices across North America all dipped down from, you know, last week because of, you know, because wow. of this arbitrage game. And so that's, that's what's so cool about the Bitcoin network is it becomes this living organism that, that, you know, works in, in tandem with humanity and consumes all the waste and gives us a reason to produce more than we need. Um, without mm -hmm. economically having such a cost. So like, I'm really excited about building that future. I think if, if these things excite you, definitely get involved. Um, but, but for anybody listening, check out Upstream Data. We're, we're an awesome company. Um, give us a look, upstreamdata.com. And then obviously follow Nat on Twitter and, and on YouTube and subscribe because honestly, I, I did want to give you some props. You're awesome on, on the mainstream, right? Like oh, on, on, on Fox Business and stuff, when you talk about Bitcoin, you do a fantastic, almost every single time I'm like, I'm, I'm, you know, doing a fist pump, like awesome, uh, you know, Natalie, you. Natalie nailed it because there's so much bad representation out there. There's so much crypto nonsense and, you know, my digital portfolio crap and yeah. you're, you're pure signal. So, so thanks well, for, I, for the work you do. Keep, keep kicking ass out there. Well, I really appreciate it. I'm so grateful that I had the chance to connect with you in this space because you're doing really inspiring and and just fascinating work. I, I agree with you that I think that the energy industry will be revolutionized and all the different sectors within it. I'm so excited to witness that future. You've made me believe what I already did have faith in, which is that we're so extremely early. I have no idea what so the early. next decades. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I loved your price prediction earlier, but we'll have a, a link in the show notes to all of your work. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been awesome. And I hope everyone connects with you. I know you'll be at some of these conferences coming up this year. So Adam, thanks so much. Hey, thanks, Natalie. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for checking out this episode of the Coin Stories podcast brought to you by BitDeer. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on any new content. This show is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing should constitute as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. My inbox is open if you want to share feedback or guest suggestions. You can reach me at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. I'll see you next time.